But I think what's really important in this too, if we have a metric that drives a behavioral change, because you're going to help them with their economic performance, you're also going to help them with their capacity constraints, because theoretically, there's at least 30 to 40% capacity available in everybody's data center right now. I'm delighted today to be joined by a leading technology executive in the global digital infrastructure. My guest today is Dean Nelson, who is the founder and the chair of the Infrastructure Masons. Over his 30-year career, Dean led the Metal team at Uber, responsible for the Metal as a Service technical infrastructure that is currently servicing and serving Uber's global ride-sharing business. He also worked at eBay as the Global Foundation VP for the Global Foundation Services. Over his career, he has driven $10 billion in infrastructure projects, producing award-winning innovations in mission-critical facilities and compute environments. He holds multiple patents and has created the Digital Service Efficiency Methodology. He currently serves as the CEO at Cato. The discussion today will be focused on two pillars of sustainability. How enhancing the profitability of multi-tenanted data centers can reduce the environmental impact of the infrastructure. We will explore both the operators and the tenants' perspectives. I sincerely hope you enjoy the session as much as we enjoyed recording it. And uh, with that, let's begin. How about we start with what's the state of the land? You, you have interesting stats and, and you've been publishing a lot of uh, interesting research about that. Um, yeah. Are we running out of capacity and, 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 yeah. and what's happening in the industry? All right, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll set some context here. And the very first thing is we, we, we established a baseline uh, through Infrastructure Masons, and I published this back in uh, 2022. And primarily for us to understand, first off, what is our industry? What does it entail? Mm -hmm. And then how big is it? And then from there, we can start to now extrapolate out what the, the future is looking like. But um, what we have today is 7 million data center locations. Okay, these are unique addresses with everything from 100 kilowatts uh, on a street corner back up to gigawatt campuses. So 7 million unique real estate locations that are addressable. And this is important because we know they're unique. Okay, mm -hmm. secondly, they have 105 gigawatts of built capacity. This is UPS generators capacity that can be used by people inside of that data center. Okay, 105 gigawatts globally. Yes. Then uh, they consume 594 terawatt hours of energy. Okay. And that results in 2.4% of the total energy draw is attributed to digital infrastructure. And I do describe digital infrastructure as real estate locations that are serving people and machines. Okay. This is a concentration of equipment inside of something that's actually serving yeah. those two. Yeah. Okay. And then we classify this in three categories. This is providers. This is cloud, enterprise, et cetera. Think mm -hmm. of all the different types. Then there's network. And then we also have one that's crypto, right? And this is controversial, yeah. people, but this is around blockchain and, and really a lot of the things that's translated into large consumption. The one third of the actual power consumption is crypto. Yeah. Okay. And a large, I don't think people you know, realize that, but yes. Yeah. Well, it's the Bitcoin conversations that's come up in the media and everything else. But the key is that that's grown so fast. But when you consider this, the reason this is important, I established the baseline. I defined this because we've been having debates all over the place. How big is our industry? Oh, is it single digits, double digits when it comes to growth and or, or energy consumption? And what's it going to grow to? And what's the carbon footprint? And it's very difficult to, to hit a moving target. So we established mm -hmm. this one. These are 21, 20, 2021 numbers based on that. But the categories were classified specifically to be able to know that there's more than just the traditional data center that people were using before. And what I'm saying is a co-location or an enterprise class data center. The 7 million locations is all of them. Okay, so, mm -hmm. and the largest consumption of power and capacity is network. People are mm -hmm. not expecting that, right? 
they're expecting the providers to have the largest portfolios. But those networks have been around longer than those data centers. This is all the carriers. This is all, just think of everything that was established initially, right? The, the central offices to the yeah. carrier hotels, to all that stuff. So my, my point is that now that we have that classification, we can now set, well, where are we today? So we've got those numbers. Where are mm -hmm. we going to go? And then what's the carbon footprint associated with all of that? So let me just stop there first. That's the baseline, okay, of mm -hmm. our industry. We define the boundaries. We define the capacity. We define the consumption. Fantastic. So, so we have 7 million data centers. And if, if you look at the, the change that has happened from, if you look at early 2000 to, to 2025, the bulk of the infrastructure in early 2000 were enterprise data centers. Today, the mix is, you know, hyperscalers, edge, right, where, where data needs to be processed. I think that's the bulk, about pr probably 45 to 50%. And then the rest, about 20, 25 is, is on-prem data centers and all that. But 7 million. And then you have the buzzwords that we need to talk about uh, after uh, beyond Bitcoin and blockchain, AI will have an impact. So everybody's talking about, and the industry has been talking mm -hmm. about, we need to build more. We need to build more. <clears throat> and one of the key topics that uh, in the last uh, conference that we joined uh, or we attended, and you, you, uh, you were on a panel talking about it, before we start building more, we have a baseline. Let's look at how we optimize what we have. And you had some interesting stats about the capacity. And I think you used Virginia as an example. And this is where I want to take a deeper dive uh, into that. <clears throat> I want to look at it from both perspectives, financial perspective and environmental perspective. Because sure. again, these are the two of the three pillars for environmental uh, sustainability and, 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 and the environment. And, and be looking at it as well from an operator perspective and a client, somebody who's hosted in those locations. So uh, can you share with us an, the, 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 uh, the stats about Virginia? Yeah, so at Northern Virginia, so basically Loudoun County uh, mm -hmm. is the largest data center market in the world. And public numbers are that there's 2000 megawatts, um, right? Two gigawatts just in that county that's allocated. Yes. I believe it's at least twice that number, but what's publicly stated is the 2000. And the numbers that are actually measured off of that is of that 2000 megawatts, again, almost every COLA provider, cloud company, enterprise, et cetera, has a presence inside of Virginia because it was where everything was established. The majority of internet traffic goes through there. The more the, the serving is through there. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is of those 2000 megawatts, right? There's no more power left. We have a whopping 0% available capacity. So what does that mean? No power left in the grid or no power left in, in the data centers or both? 2,000 megawatts has been allocated to colos and enterprises, right? Including clouds. Mm -hmm. And they are, it is dedicated to them. So the, the thing that, that people are missing in this is mm -hmm. we are out of capacity. Absolutely. We're out of allocated capacity. But the reality mm -hmm. is this. There is currently 1.2 gigawatts or 1,200 megawatts of capacity consumption of that 2,000. That is 60 percent. Can you that number again? I want to I want to emphasize that number. So 2,000 yeah. megawatts of allocated capacity, 1,200 mm -hmm. megawatts of consumption. There is 800 mm -hmm. megawatts of capacity that is delivered and never used ever. Okay, mm -hmm. so. We don't have a capacity shortage. We have a utilization problem. And that is stemming from a whole bunch of industry assumptions, right? That have led to buffers on buffers on buffers. The amount of stranded capacity and wasted capacity in our industry is the dirty little secret. And when you have a moving train, you know, the industry is like a moving train. It has been moving at such a speed where you build a data center, you allocate the power, you, uh, and I'm putting my financial hat uh, the, the way I, you know, I, 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 I was wearing at, at Pier 1 Hosting when we were managing so many data centers and saying, well, my uh, NPV for the data center or my IRR model is working because I yep. have my cash flow, right? I have X amount of capacity, 10 megawatt data center. I sold that 10 megawatt. I'm going to go build another one, yep. right? And the problem with that thinking right now is we're hitting the reality, the realities of two things. Number one, we are not making more land. Land is becoming expensive. Mm -hmm. 
and the power grid is at capacity in a lot of areas. And some of the edge locations where we're deploying, you're looking at investing capital. So the industry now is saying, well, can I pre-commit some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some funds for consumption where I can help the utility companies fund the extra next expansion? And when that will be delivered, we'll tell you when, when it's happening, right? And nobody will really that, right? <laughs> So the question is, how do we optimize the existing data center? So if I'm looking at it and I'm, 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 I'll go back to my old position where I'm, I, you know, I was the senior leader for the financial area and looking at this as a CFO and saying, well, okay, so I have 800 megawatts of allocated power, but is not used. How mm -hmm. can I start you? And that, that basically for me tackles two areas. One, it increases the cash flow and the returns for a data center and reduces my capital and, and, and defers my capital or CapEx uh, outlay several years because I don't need to go buy no new land. I don't need to go now uh, fight for the supply chain lead times, which has been longer and longer. I don't need to look at getting more power and paying for that so we can figure out how uh, I'm going to fund, uh, I'm going to get the returns on it. I can look at optimizing our existing. So 105 gigawatts of capacity right now, right? So if we're looking at optimizing it, or I go back to the two uh, gigawatt of um, uh, the Northern Virginia uh, market, 800 is a big percentage. Right? 40%. So, so how should an operator look at that? So I look at it from an operator and I look at it from a customer. So from an operator, how can we help operators look at this and saying, well, Mr. Operator, I know you're tracking your PUE and you're happy with it. What else should we look at? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this in two buckets, okay? Um, because okay. this is is not as straightforward as people think. Mm -hmm. We have behaviors that happen because of well entrenched industry assumptions that have been applied for decades. All right, and I've been in the industry 34 years. So I've seen these waves. I've been a part of these waves. I actually starred in these in some of these movies, right? When you think about the different jobs that I've had. So whether it was Uber, eBay, PayPal, some microsystems, we've seen a lot of this. Yeah. And what I'm telling you is that um, there's a financial consideration mm -hmm. that you just talked through. And then there's an implementation and contract limitation. All right. So I'm going to start with first off. It makes perfect sense that you could make more money. You could absolutely make more money from the capacity that you're not using, right? Mm -hmm. So why are they not doing that? And why have they not done that for the last two decades? Because nothing's changed, right? Mm -hmm. It's two reasons. First is the majority of data center companies are established as real estate trusts, the REITs. A REIT is basically saying, I'm gonna take capital in, I'm going to deploy it. I'm going to build assets. Those assets are going to have a life and I'm going to have a predictable, consistent return across a 10 year cycle, a 10 year life. Yeah. Okay. What that REIT cares about is basically occupancy, duration, and rate. Those three metrics are really important, right? So that 10 megawatt data center you just outlined, hey, I just sold 10 megawatts. Awesome. How long did you do it for? Seven-year contract. Awesome. What rate? $120 a kilowatt. Beautiful. Okay. How is it utilized? Okay. Here's the other factor. First off, take that 60%. That's a pretty common number, and I still think it's conservative. Of the allocated capacity that's in a data center, 60% or less of it is used on average. Okay? Mm -hmm. So for the real estate trust, they don't consider those factors because quote unquote, they're out of their control. Secondly, there is no metric in a REIT model that looks at the utilization of that capacity. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so this is driving behavior because when you go talk to a colo, they're measured based on those other metrics. Okay, how much asset, what do you have in your asset portfolio? How much of it is rented? For how long and what, and what price? Great, when you say I'm sold out in Ashburn, it's because I've sold all my capacity but there's 40% left on the table. So logically you would think, well, I could go back and get 40% more revenue. I should be able to utilize more of this, right? But yeah. the real estate structure that's set up for the majority of cola companies right now does not drive that outcome. Well, I'm gonna challenge that a bit. 
or add to it, maybe not just ch not challenge, challenge a bit, but add. There is a simple concept, and I think in the um, the big short, um, um, uh, Michael Lewis talks about it. You want to know how people move, look at how they're incentivized. Yep. Um, the investment in real estate, uh, you know, you're looking also as well beyond the commit of uh, the returns, maximizing the returns, right? Uh -huh. So uh, if I'm looking at a data center, I sold the capacity that is available there. And, and, now, and now I have to go deploy cash. <laughs> it's an IRR model uh, mm -hmm. in terms of rate of return or an MPV net present value model. And you look at it, it makes sense. It hits my return percentage or, 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 or target, then I'm going to do it and I'm going to continue doing it. The thing is you're leaving a lot of money on the table and that goes to the first pillar of the sustainability, right? And the second piece of that is um, the industry has been driving innovation and oversubscription in every aspect. So if I look at the network, the concept of network oversubscription, deploying fiber in the ground uh, and cable and saying, well, I'm going to sell you one gig. But that one gig provided that X number of people are on that uh, on that coaxial or that, and so on and so forth. Oversubscription is on the network. Oversubscription is on the storage. You know, you know, we, we manage data centers and infrastructure, and we used to buy the network array or the storage arrays, and we know, okay, once we hit certain threshold, we're gonna ex expand more. But oversubscription is there. Oversubscription is on the CPU and the hypervisors, the, the cloud operators, and, and that's the whole concept of virtualization. So the only area that we don't allow oversubscription is power, and is the it's one of the key areas that is so stable that it doesn't fluctuate like compute or network, and, and right. which is mind-boggling. Where I still don't understand why the industry has been saying, "Well, we're fine with the returns." Although there is a door here or there's an avenue here that we can maximize the cash flow, we can apply the oversubscription of on on a variable or an input that it is slow to move and we're able to manage and and I can defer my capital outlay, which enhances my IRR, IRR models and MPV models. So so wh how what can we do to 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 change that? What how, what should we measure? And, so and, and I know there's the metrics that you've been talking about for a while, and Absolutely. I want to expand on that one. Okay, so so I'm going to get to there in a second, but I just want to yeah. I want to add a little more clarity. When you think about this REIT model, um, they also have specific things about reinvestment. So in other words, when I go back and say I'm going to put in this, and I have X amount of money generated, so I've rented 100% of that capacity, right? Regardless of the utilization, I've rented it. Well, 80% of those profits need to be rolled into more assets, mm -hmm. right? So that's why there's no incentive that's being driven to say, I should optimize to get more revenue out of that. My real estate model is driving more assets to be built, okay? And this is the dirty little secret I talk about. It yeah. still is, that that's why we get certain things in there. But but this it's both on the supplier and the buyer side. <clears throat> what I mean here, <clears throat> sorry. What I mean here on the, on the supplier and the buyer side, the supplier is the colo. They're driven by REIT, right? REIT mm -hmm. structures that has what they're incentivized by are those three things I mentioned, right? Occupancy, duration, and rate. Mm -hmm. Then you look at, um, they're also driven by requirements from the tenant. And a lot of them are coming in and saying, nope, that's dedicated capacity. That's for me. You cannot share that with something. You cannot oversubscribe it. Look at the majority of contracts. I expect a 5.9 SLA with a PUE of X that's right consistent, trailing 12-month average. And, and so they have metrics that are driven that way, which now limits what the colo can do. It's not that they don't want to do something with this. They're limited based on contractual obligations from the tenant. Okay, so, and, and just, we have two behaviors here that are driving yeah. outcomes. Now, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing these back up is that's the realities that I faced in my company. We virtualized mm -hmm. power. We could not get traction with the colo side because of those factors. First off, they couldn't go back and actually get oversubscription because of their model. It didn't make sense. There was no incentive for them, right? Secondly, yeah. you have the tenants saying, well, I can't do that. These are assumptions we've made in the industry for decades, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the next forcing function, just like PUE, is that we're out of capacity. Now what? We'll go to another market. Well, I need to be in Ashburn. Okay, that's going to drive 
cons- cost. basically, well, it's not just the cost element. It's going to drive, um, they're going to make compromises in their assumptions from before. So in other words, you're either going to need to generate more on-site power there to give to people, but you're also going to need to challenge those contracts. I've just allocated you all this and you're only using 60% of the capacity. So working with the tenant to figure out how to do that is super mm-hmm. critical. But guess what? We don't have a metric that's actually driving visibility to that like PUE did. As soon as we launched PUE, by the way, this came out of the green grid, got established, mm-hmm. was right? Uh, actually written into law in the U.S. and it's become the global standard. Christian Bellotti wrote that. Mm-hmm. He basically created that on an airplane coming back from Japan to help them understand the ratio between the actual power for the IT and the mechanical electrical and basically waste on the other side. Yeah. Okay. And what happened from that metric was it got exposed. And we had PUEs of 2.6, 3, 4. They were horrible. Yeah. And everyone said, I can't let that happen. So that PUE became a competitive advantage for people. And it kept driving it down, 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 down. And some of the best in the world are less than 1.1. Right? Just the Googles and, and, and some yeah. of the high dealers. That's right? because they own the entire stack and they optimize the thing as a system. But then everybody else is kind of a bit higher in the 1.3s. And I think the average is still 1.6 compared to where it was 2.6 when it was starting. Average. Which is which is another forty percent that is sitting right there from an optimization perspective that we can we can talk about it. You got uh, it. So, you got so it. and so this and this and Jad, this goes back to the metric. So this yeah. this has been a frustrating thing for me um, because first off, it is not economically sustainable and it is not environmentally sustainable when we look at what we're trying to accomplish. So so I wanted to go back and see: is there a way we could provide a forcing function that will give the visibility to be able to make that happen? So instead of power usage effectiveness, which is the right side of the decimal, Mm -hmm. we created power capacity effectiveness, Mm -hmm. which is the whole thing, the one, right? It's the left Mm -hmm. side of the decimal. We are assuming the one in a 1.2 is 100%. It is not. It's 60% at best. So if we now look at the whole data center as a system and we say, I built 12 and a half megawatts to sell 10 and they consume six. My power capacity effectiveness is less than 50%. Yeah. That right there exposes and drives conversations. Now they're going to say, why? Oh, well, I have to I have to have the buffers on here, and then I also have the utilizations and I have the limited limitation of dedicated capacity. And so so now all of these assumptions and things that are coming out can be challenged. So that's what I'm trying to accomplish with power capacity effectiveness. I want us to be raised to a business level, to have both an economic conversation and an optimization conversation that you just outlined at the beginning. There's so much money left on the table. Why are we not getting that? There is so much money and the impact on, you know, building a new facility and, 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 and all, all the environmental aspects of running an inefficient infrastructure. So I want, I want, I want to, I want to slow down the conversation here to look at it from two lenses, right? Okay. From an operator lens which basically i you know you and i came you came from more the the uh, the, the the consumer side you you know with ebay with 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 uber and 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 others you were taking the capacity you're you're saying i want to over subscribe because i i, I want to be i want to make sure that i have enough capacity for the future everybody does that that has been the norm we do that in everything we do wanna, i, I want a buffer a buffer wanna, for risk uh, yeah, you know, That's... when when I when I was buying hardware for in in two thousand and seven to two thousand and twelve, I'm spending twenty five million dollars. Like, do you buy a Benz or do you buy a, a VW? Not that mm-hmm. one, but you know <laughs> what I'm saying. Like, let let's let's yeah. soup up the servers because we will always use it, right? And so, if if I look at it from an operator perspective, operators are wholesale or or retailers, and some are a mix, right? Mm-hmm. I could see the challenge. If you have a wholesale operator saying, well, I allocated this capacity to a hyperscaler or a big enterprise, there's less leeway there. But then you look at the retail uh, co-location markets and think this is where, this is a low hanging fruit for the industry. Anybody who's running a retail uh, co-location and you know, if I was wearing my old hat at Pier 1 Hosting, which we were retail, mm-hmm. um, I would look at it and say, hold on, I am leaving so much money on the table 
my my IRR model, my internal rate of return model for this data center would be completely different if I use the oversubscription by a certain percentage. And then my PUE would be better because, uh, uh, again, you know, I have more yeah. IT. So from an environmental perspective, it's better. And from a financial perspective, it's better. And I'm deferring CapEx allocation to build another pod, which is you know $7 million or $10 million and the cost of capital for that. It's not the rat race that I, I want to run uh, all the time. So this is where the PCE becomes from an operator perspective, specifically for retail, becomes valuable. Now, on a contractual side, uh, I actually started reviewing different various contracts since we started having similar discussions about it six months ago. The, the operator is obligated to provide the capacity. They, they, they give you, uh, you know, a, a, a circuit and, and, you know, A, B power and you're done. You're using it. They fulfill their obligation. But as an operator, if you're monitoring those KPIs, then you know what, what your buffer is and you can still yeah. allocate some of those empty cages or <laughs> empty cabinets that you have. So I think this is, this is an area that is ripe for um, 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 uh, disruption right now. And, and yeah. I use it that way because you're going against the norm as an, 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 an operator. So the first takeaway, I think, for, for retail co-location operators is to look at the PCE as one of the primary uh, uh, KPIs beside the PUE. Both of sure. them are relevant. And a PUE, um, you know, it, it is a needed uh, uh, KPI, absolutely, but it's not the one and all. Uh, and, and it is deceiving just to look at the infrastructure, in my opinion, as uh, from a PUE perspective. Oh, it's it's now, diminishing returns. Totally. So that's that's one one persona. So the operator. So now take it to the persona where a, a consumer who uh, or or an, an enterprise that goes and says, you know what, I want to allocate 100 uh, uh, KVAs, right? And, mm -hmm. and and this is, believe me, we are seeing that with our customers, you know, using our tools, looking at their infrastructure. And I had this discussion, if not 20, probably 50 times over the past six months. So, yeah. okay, what power am I getting? What power committed? And what's my PUE, right? And, 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 and it kind of stops there when they're feeling comfortable. It's like, okay, I'm using this amount of power and, and this is the power that I'm using. But then I had a, multiple discussions around, but you're committing for 100 and you're using 23. Right, exactly. Because they're looking at the right side of the decimal. They're not looking at the left. So put your financial hat on. How much waste are you? Like what? Uh, what? Like, and and what? What measure can a a, a, yeah. a customer look at? So, yeah. PUE is 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 good, right? Because you're looking at hey, um, am, am I wasting things? If do I need to optimize my rack efficiency factor, or do I need to change mm -hmm. the hardware, or do I need to put heaters to consume more power so I can I can look back? <laughs> PUE, Please you know, don't. take it to the extreme, but. <laughs> The flip side of that, enhancing the financial performance. If I'm looking at a VP of finance or a controller of, of, a, of, a, of a company that is, is, is utilizing co-location, right? And saying, well, what is the metrics? Is it DCIE? Is it, uh, uh, or is it, is it basically the IT energy divided by the IT commit? Is that what we look at? And then you're looking at it and it's like, oh, I'm only utilizing 23%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is that the right metrics? Yeah, this is basically this it's is a new saying. metric. You give a holistic picture into what it is that you're actually operating. And um, and by the way, my, my, my past, I owned the data center, the hardware, the network, the supply chain, the budget management, the orchestration, the efficiency goal, sustainability. I own the engine, right, in these yeah. different uh, jobs that I had. And we had, we had a systems thinking approach. We designed our own hardware. We built our own data centers. We deployed into partner data centers as well, and we optimized everything. The best I could get in that was still 60% utilization of contracted power. And that's when we owned the stack. Okay. So What's there that? are, there What's are some challenges. The buffers there? Yep. So the challenges here are there are buffers on buffers on buffers. And I'm talking about it from the application level down to the shared platform, right, to the compute platform virtualization, to the actual hardware, to the data center itself. All of these things continually add buffers. And that result is 40% of that capacity is never used. So we need to challenge those buffers, okay? But why do they do that? Is it they want to waste? 
No, everybody's saying risk. I got to be careful. I have to make sure I have to have a 5.9 SLA in my data center, period, which means, and then I need to have 20% headroom in my breakers and everything else. Must mm-hmm. not ever exceed that. So everybody buffers up. Then you look at the servers. Well, I build a server with CPUs and GPUs and memory and, and network network injections and all that. Well, if all of those components are on, I this will is- draw. Yeah. Yeah. So then I'm going to size my power supply to ensure that when I hit 100% of everything, I'm okay. And then I'm going to have a redundant supply. And then I'm going to add buffer on that one because what if it actually goes and has an issue? Surge. So buffers on buffers. None of those servers run 100% of those components ever. Hence the nameplate versus the reality. But that, that, that's, that's where you, that's the baseline that people need to be looking at. It. That's where the, these are the KPIs based on the actual consumption of IT energy, either from the, the outlet Excellent. level of PDU or from... At the server level. And, and this, is, this is the thing is, this is all about visibility. If you don't have visibility to the data, you're going to make uninformed decisions. And so when we go back and look at, um, I've just deployed 100 racks in this hall and that, right? And I've contracted, you know, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, uh, two megawatts, okay? So I've got 20 kilowatts of cabinet and I'm using seven. Are you looking at those numbers? Right, because the rent is a foregone conclusion. I've contracted this. Well, if I'm using less, I'm using less power, so I'm paying less power. But you're yeah. still wasting a significant amount of capacity. So, so then you look at that. You got to you got to unpack it. And by the way, what you guys do at Hyperview helps people understand it. It's it simply is. I will get visibility into my IT assets, my data center, and now if you look at it from a power capacity standpoint, I'm looking at it from my contractual obligations and my consumption. Yeah. Then it drives the conversation to say, what can I do about that? Yeah, and, and where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to simplify the discussion and, and, and focus the discussion is providing those, and this is the point that you started with, is around the baseline and the benchmark. Mm-hmm. My challenge right now, like I'm looking at the new regulations from uh, the, the cor- uh, Corporate Reporting Sustainability uh, Directive or corporate, uh, too many uh, FLAs, uh, the European yeah. standard that came out, right? And uh, they're listing, uh, well, we want you to, to, to report the PUE, the renewable energy factor, the IT energy efficiency, the IT utilization uh, uh, for servers, the energy reuse, the cooling efficiency factor. And it goes la, 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 la. Like, how, like, how do you take this information and say, Jane Smith or John Smith, this is the information that you should be looking at and this is what it means. So this is where I'm taking this. I'm saying we need to take those KPIs and look at it, look at it from an operator perspective mm-hmm. and a, uh, a user perspective. And in the user perspective, I want to look at it from financial and operational and have it a single pane of glass. So an operational perspective, you're absolutely right. It's all about buffer and risk, risk management. I want to make sure that I have enough capacity that Just in case. enables some growth and I want a redundancy and, and that's what I'm concerned with. But if, I, if, I, if you give that to a financial professional that doesn't understand the industry and looks at, looks at this and saying, well, what does this mean? This is where I look at the contracted power and the utilized power and saying, you're at 23% utilization. Like I, I, and, and that is the one metrics. Like if I am the, the, totally the, the CFO of, 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 uh, uh, of a company and, and, and that has collocated uh, assets, I would look at that as like, that's the only metrics I want to look at. Because mm-hmm. that in, in a nutshell tells me I'm wasting X amount. How much buffer do you want? 10, 20%? Fantastic. Then I can right. reduce that. The implication of that, that frees up capacity for the operators. And, and, and that becomes a positive feedback. Now, this is where operator, user, and then persona, financial and, and, and environmental. And the, the, the second piece of this discussion is sustainability is, is a key um, um, driver right now for the industry. Mm-hmm. And it should be, period. And I want to make sure that it, it is aligned. The first pillar, enhancing the economic performance, is so important because you want to know how people move. Look at how they're incentivized. Making it profitable, meaning making it more energy efficient, is a good, is a good outcome. Yeah. So this is where 
I think the PCE needs to be one of the key metrics for the industry. Because yeah. if I am an operator looking at this, I'm a retail operator. All right, now if my PCE is 40%, well, I can oversubscribe. I'm contractually providing that power to my customers. Sure. And I still have a buffer within mm -hmm. a buffer, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where, uh, the, you know, I'm, you know, I would like the industry to move. And, and, and the idea here is how do we get it there? How can we talk more about it? And this is why I wanted to talk about this mm -hmm. today, because that, that, um, uh, conference dice, which was fantastic and hearing the industry talking about the challenges, land, uh, power, grid, uh, microgrids, the investment that is required, all good. And talking about going from 105 to 300 gigs, good. But the question is, we have 105 gigawatt of power, which represents, was it 2.5% of energy utilization? 2.4% of global energy draw. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and by the way, that, of that 105 gigawatts of capacity, at yeah. least 37 gigawatts is never used. 37 gigawatts. Now you tell That's, me any investor. I'm raising my hands, raising yeah. my hands right now. <laughs> any investor out there to say, what's the yield? What, what am I getting on my, my return for this capital putting in there? Right? So so the fact that it's contract, that's why I keep going back to the REIT structure. I really believe that the, the, the private equity and those kind of things need to be doing PCE at the top level, at the boardroom mm -hmm. level. And the reason for that one is they need to look at what's my asset and how well is that asset utilized? Exactly. Because now it goes back to, like you said, I'm going to do a roll capital in. Well, I should be getting the return on my capital. You could get more. But but this is this is an important point. If we can now have a common way in which we're measuring that, it will drive behavior. The most complex thing to do is to simplify complexity. You've just done it. If I just have power capacity effectiveness, it will drive behavior change. For right? the operator. Yeah. So no, for both. Because the operator will see it, but the power capacity effectiveness now that the tenant, right, that customer is going to look at it and go, crap, that's 23%. What am I doing wrong? What is this? And then that can be escalated up the chain where they can now go to their partners, right? The compute platform, the shared virtualization platform, the others and say, I'm trying to figure out how to optimize this because we have basically at a minimum, mm -hmm. if we go to the 60% side, right? Mm -hmm. We have a minimum of 37% upside of capacity in the existing facilities we're in to get to 60%, 23 to 60, just that. The risk, zero. Because if you get to 60%, you have 40% headroom, and then you have another 25% on top of that for failures because of the redundancy that's built into the data center. So there's an economic incentive. But I think what's really important in this too, if we have a metric that drives a behavioral change, because you're going to help them with their economic performance. You're also going to help them with their capacity constraints because theoretically, there's at least 30 to 40% capacity available in everybody's data center right now. If we are sold out everywhere, you can go back and get that. You just need to see it. You need to look at it and drive the conversations to be able to get access to it. That could be oversubscription. That could be optimization. That could be all these things that can be done. But then the last point of this, Jed, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I get across. If we do that, we are avoiding building more data centers. And if you look at the IMASIN's climate accord from a sustainability standpoint, everything mm -hmm. is driven on decarbonization of digital infrastructure. That decarbonization is based on three factors. The materials that build the building, concrete, steel, copper, etc. There's an embodied carbon footprint from all of those and getting to the point where that data center can be used. Then mm -hmm. you have the equipment inside of it. They have their own embodied carbon footprint to get that product to the point where it could be used. Okay, fills the data center with equipment. Then you have the power. And that power is the carbon intensity of the energy. So if you are able to go back and eke out 20 to 40% more capacity in that data center, I just avoided building 20 to 40% more buildings with a 10 to 50 year impact mm -hmm. on embodied carbon, right? And I've yep. lowered my cost. I've driven my utilization up. I've increased my efficiency. I've lowered my PUE. Like everything gets better economically and ecologically. 
Agreed. And I think the operative word here is, is not avoiding, is deferment, because I think we will at some point require building new data centers, but it's, it's a slower pace. It's not just avoiding building data centers. Uh, well, well, actually, I'm going to challenge you on one, one thing yeah. with that, because yes, we're going to build a bunch more. Um, there's a forcing function right now that I can't. <laughs> there's no room yeah. to do it in Ashburn. You, the only way you can go back and get capacity is to optimize what you've got right now. That's why PCE becomes a really, really critical thing. What can I get? How do I justify it? Think of the data center operators and what they're trying to accomplish and think about the tenants. The yeah. guys that are running the data centers, those folks, if they have a metric, they're able to go back up the chain and say, I can get us 20% capacity right now if our teams align on utilization. Yeah, it's, 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 it, it, your point is valid. It's, it's taking those complex uh, problems and simplifying it. And those three questions uh, are, are extreme, extremely important and, 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 and focuses the discussion. It's funny, you know, we're using the same language when, when customers talk to us or, or clients talk to us about, hey, how should I think about uh, the, the corporate sustainability reporting directive? This is, this is coming or SB 25. Three or two fifty three from California is that is that something I should be looking at and and my answer to that it, it, think about environmental reporting like any tax reporting it's coming right and the way you look at it and and this came out out of a discussion I had with you actually it's the three questions where am I hosted that has an impact because the source of power and the embodied carbon construction cost so where yep. am I hosted <laughs> the second question is how am I hosted? You're talking mm -hmm. about the utilization of the infrastructure. You're looking at the scope to impact based on the IT energy of every asset that you have, right? And then what am I sourcing, which is the scope three. So that gives you the, the environmental impact. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and really what's driving this for me, and, and, uh, and I believe it's the same passion that you have around this, around the sustainability, is I am worried about some of the the uh, um, uh, commitments that companies have done or have, have publicly put out for 2030 or 2035, you know, optimistically, I would say they're aspirational. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and pessimistically, I would say they're BS because, you know, several discussions I've been having say, well, we're going to buy offsets because we can't measure. And this is why I, I want to be very vocal about these discussions from a sustainability is get the, the, the complexity out of the discussion, have people focused on key metrics. PCE is one for me. It is, and, and I agree with you. Since since we started talking about it several months ago, I see the relevance of it from enhancing the economic performance and the impact of that. It's a cause and effect on the mm -hmm. environmental aspect. And the same discussion, PCE, uh, equally, I would say DCIE, but it, the same applies for an, a customer hosted inside the data center as well. And then from a carbon impact, the, I, we, we need to be able to measure it by asset. And where am I hosted? How am I hosted? And, and, um, and what am I sourcing? And, and, and that, that gets, gets the discussion with the stakeholders. If it's a financial stakeholder, operational, purchasing, they can look at it in the same single pane of glass and saying, okay, mm -hmm. I, know, I know where I am today. I know where am I heading because we... Optimistically, well, we have two refresh cycles by 2023, by 2030, sorry. So it's cheaper to do changes now than changes in 2028 uh, in, in magnitude and cost. Mm -hmm. I know we're over time, but uh, you know, I could talk about this forever with you because <laughs> I enjoy it. I enjoy the time we spend. Uh, any, any final thoughts on how we can um, spread the word about PCE and about, about simplifying this metrics and, 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 and making it available? Is this something that, you know, in my opinion, encourage everybody to, to, to have it in their corporate reporting, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is where digital infrastructure is able to contribute back to the sustainability reporting by having a standardized way in which they can measure. And this is both between PCE, that is about the optimization of what we've got. This is also about what are we going to build and what assumptions are we making for the next build? So optimization of existing environments, but actually setting the stage to do this more sustainably from day one because we're tripling our demand right our global capacity tripling in the next five years because of generative ai 
Yeah. We must build these sustainably. And so that's why PCE is a, a really important thing that now instead of walking in and saying, in my contract, I want to have a, P, a PUE of 1.3 or less. Now you're going to say, and I want a PCE of 50% or more. Something yeah. that'll yeah. drive the behavior on the colo and on the tenant side. The, the funny thing is, and the interesting thing I would say is optimizing PCE will optimize PUE. And <laughs> to say positive, right, right. It, it is. Because all complementary. All complementary. All complementary. So actually yeah. adopting PCE and oversubscribing power will help you on the P, PUE aspect. And, and yeah. you can still have the buffer of the buffer of the buffer. So it's, yeah. it's, 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 so it's I, amazing. I will give two, two pieces of advice. And what I'm, I'm, I want to first do is for the executives out there, I'm talking mm -hmm. about board level. C-level, mm -hmm. VP level, and director level. If you're able to now bring up a very simple question, right? Whether it's your own portfolio or your provided portfolio to tenants, ask the owners of that capacity what their power capacity effectiveness is. That's the only question you need to do. At the next board meeting, at the next staff meeting, at the next staff report, I would like to go back and see what our PCE is. Yeah. Okay, just that. So that's coming from the top down. The bottom up, what I would suggest for the people that are operating these data centers, whether it's the actual supplier or the, the consumer of it, go back and actually measure your PCE and expose it internally and mm -hmm. say, this is what I found. Uh, any ideas on how we might be able to actually enhance it? So we will drive the behaviors in both sides, accountability from the executive level down and opportunity from the bottom up yeah. to be able to say, <clears throat> we're wasting, there's a lot of headroom because trust me, I'm sure these data center managers, IT managers and everything are saying, I have no capacity. How am I supposed to support, support generative AI and cloud growth or whatever else? You've got 20 to 30% capacity you can actually eke out of your existing portfolio right now. It's simply exposing the metrics. It's, it's um, you know, yep. and people are running so, and teams are overworked and running so busy right now. I, I had several discussions around, like, do I have enough capacity? Well, what's your rack efficiency factor? Are you stacking them like as pancakes or Swiss cheese? Because you could have the power, but you don't have the rack space. And it's just exposing the metrics. PCE yep. is very important. And I gave you my commitment. This is going to be one of the key metrics that is going to be in Hyperview, and it will be uh, in Excellent. early 2024. It will Thank be one of the support. Key metrics. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Absolutely, it, it 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 gives so much visibility, and and the more we talk about it, and and emphasizing the financial impact, positive yep. impact of it, yep. and it, as a result, also the in, impact on PUE is very mm -hmm. important, and that's where we need to link it. People move based on how they're incentivized, increasing yep. the returns. Specifically for retail colo, in this case, it makes makes absolute sense to to, to, to adopt that metrics. Yeah, and um, by the way, not just retail, multi-tenant data centers multi -tenant, anywhere, absolutely, as well as single-tenant wholesale data centers, because it's the same problem. There's more opportunity in a in a, a mixed environment, but each of them have the same power capacity, right? Efficiency or effectiveness problem, just at different varying degrees. To to total agreement. I'm very pragmatic about um uh, um. Um, uh, introducing solutions. I, I think the low hanging fruit is in retail because if you go to somebody who has leased the full data center, it's it, the contractual commitment yeah. are more rigid and yeah. that's a bit longer I, conversation. I, I agree. I agree. What I'm saying is retail may be a limited word. People have a definition of what retail Correct. is. What I'm saying is a multi-tenant data center is more than one tenant. So that can be retail, that can be wholesale, that can be colo, that can be, you know, multi-tenant inside of an enterprise data center. The whole yeah. point is there's lots of users inside of it. There's lots of opportunity. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we drive innovation in so many industries. Uh, might as well start adopting some of the, the innovations that we've, we, we, we've uh, enabled <laughs> in the industry. Oversubscription is a, is a good word. <laughs> is a good mm -hmm. word. Um, and you're one of the key guardians of the infrastructure. We launched this campaign uh, for all the um, uh, hard work that uh, the guardians in, 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 in our industry that enabled us, enabled the global economy to run for uh, for years during COVID, before and after, but was amplified during COVID. So to you, sir, I'm gonna salute you. I'm gonna wear my hat and give you, you know. a salute.
um, um, or we can do the the uh, the Vulcan uh, <laughs> as well. Because uh, prosper, grow more infrastructure. Uh, thank you for your time. This has been extremely beneficial for me, and hopefully others will find it beneficial. And and um, uh, keep fighting the good fight, and see you in the next conferences because I'm planning to be uh, attending a lot of them, and hopefully in in PTC as well. Awesome! Thanks for having me on.